Let's move on to another guy who gets it done, Russell Westbrook. He was ejected in the third quarter last night. Not as much getting it done. Mm. It was because he was arguing with the refs over whether the shot clock should have been reset or not. Afterward, he was not happy. Take a listen. It's just crazy, man, especially for me, because I feel like, you know, I don't get the benefit of that most of the time, especially throughout the game um, with refs. And I get so many texts just for talking. <clears throat> just for talking. I can't even say nothing when I'm getting hammered every time I go to the damn basket throughout the games and previous games, not tonight, but every night. Um, and I just don't get refs the same way as other people, and I don't appreciate it. Now, Westbrook might actually have a point about how he's officiated. He leads the league in technical fouls, which, frankly, is a remarkable accomplishment in a world that Boogie Cousins also lives in. <laughs> um, it, it is possible he is such an aggressive player, there's a bit too much of a hair trigger in calling these texts on him. And, frankly, in general, I think the NBA needs to lighten up on the language texts. I, I get being respectful to the officials, but we're all grown adults here, right? Including the refs. Uh, enough with these you hurt my feeling technicals. They can handle a stray curse word or two. All that being said, can we go a week here, please, without some big star in the NBA complaining that he doesn't get the calls or does get the calls or isn't getting calls he should be getting? Paul George did it the other day to such a degree he got fined 15 grand. Now it's Westbrook who, yeah, takes so much contact every time he drives the lane. He probably could get even more calls than he does. But guess what? He already leads the league in free throw attempts per game. So there's an argument to just take the win and move on and let us move on. On our website today, our Grace Young noted that a year ago, Westbrook said he sat down. He actually watched every tech he got for arguing from the previous season and tried to let it sink in that not once did the officials change their minds. At the time, he said he had resolved he was going to stop complaining. May want to check back in on that. George, where are you on this? Well, listen, I agree with you. I think that we could sit here and dissect every play and say everyone deserves more calls, mm -hmm. right? When you were playing and coaching, I'm sure you wanted more calls. That's just, that's just kind of the way this thing works. Right. But when we just came off this whole two-minute report thing with Golden mm -hmm. State and Cleveland, I think Kevin Durant made a good point, which is, and LeBron too for that matter, which is we're we're kind of scrutinizing these guys even a little too much. They're all human and they're gonna make some mistakes. You're gonna miss some stuff, even with three referees. It's why we're experimenting in the D league with four and five referees but do we need more calls do we right really need that's that? kind of my point i almost feel like that hurts the game more if we're if we're stopping play and getting to the line he's leading the league in free throw attempts enough like russ i love you but come on, pump the brakes on this one <laughs> you give westbrook a pass you, you think know, he's right i i do give him a pass because okay. I, I do think he's right to a certain extent and I, and I agree with george he is leading the league in free throw attempts so you, you can't complain too much come on but we all know Russ. You know, this is one of the fiery guys in this league. He plays with so much passion, and and, and he loves the, the competition. He loves the game. You know, so as a referee, you know, you got to sometimes, you know, hold your brakes as well because you do know who you're talking to. Right. You know, this guy is very passionate, and sometimes he's very emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's going to say some things just in the heat of the moment. And sometimes as a referee, you got to let that go. You know, so you got to understand, as a referee, you get scouting reports too, so you know when Russell's out there, he's going to probably get a little heated over certain calls. And sometimes as a ref, like I said, you got to let it go. But Russ, you can't complain too much because you are leading the league. So just kind of, you know. Let's everybody just let, take it down yeah, just like, a notch. A lot of you just all get along. A lot of young <laughs> refs in the league, by the way. That, that could be the case, too. A lot of they younger just refs in the league. Yeah, yeah. They, they want yeah. to assert themselves, right. and I get that. But yeah. we've all heard the curse words before. We don't have to get in our fainting couches. It's all good. <laughs> all right, I do want to circle back and talk about Paul George. He had a long therapeutic session with the local media in Indianapolis. It was actually guys, a little sad at one point. George said this is the most frustrated he can remember being. He even added, quote, maybe I'm just living in the past of how good we used to be. Yeah. Um, look, wow. things have certainly changed in Indiana. This is a team that it, once upon a time, right, they were the real threat to LeBron James in the East. Now they wouldn't even make the playoffs if the postseason started today. They've lost four straight. They're 15 and 18. But George is saying now he has decided he is going to change his attitude. He said, quote, I've been caught up with officials getting caught up with on-court stuff. I've lost sight of how fun this game is to me. I just have to approach it as being myself, enjoying the process, enjoying the grind. And Byron, reporters said they did see George noticeably goofing around in practice more yesterday, trying to live by his words there. Does this work? Is this going to work if he's well, you know what? happy and he knows it? Kudos to, to, to Paul for saying, you know, I, I got to make a change. You right. know, the season is not going the way we expected it. I'm not playing the way I expect to play. It, it's been rough in Indiana at this particular point. So 
I got to try to change it up. You know, that, that's great. Kudos to him for that. But you know what changes all that and makes it fun? Winning. <laughs> Bottom line, winning. You want to have fun, You can't winning. fake it till you're making no, it. No, you can't fake it. You got to go on the court. You got to produce. You guys got to come together and figure this thing out. And winning solves all that. There, there, there's, there's winning and misery. That's it. And Pat Riley know. said that. That's I, right. know, I know where you got that yeah. misery. That's it. <laughs> and he was absolutely <laughs> right. Now, now here's the thing. I, I look at it this way. He played on those really good those Indiana teams, teams yeah. that had older veteran leader guys. David West isn't around anymore. All of a sudden, Paul George is the leader of that team. And that's a role he wasn't necessarily used to. He was just used to playing his game, not having to worry about dealing with other guys and dealing with personalities. And I think it's taken him about a year and a half to kind of figure out, hey, you know what? I don't have to stress over that stuff. If I play my game, I can lead by example mm -hmm. and just kind of do it that way. Yes, but I, I agree with Byron. And winning, winning is really Solves the thing. Sure, of course. Great Solves all I think that. he would be a great leader if they were winning. I Absolutely. think he would know exactly what he was doing. <laughs> He's a fantastic player. All right. We gotta take a quick break. When we return, we will talk about a new basketball league. Ice Cube is launching for retired players, Byron, which is gonna be <laughs> so awesome. Um, but first, hey, here's our distant replay from this date in 2001, <laughs> starring our own Tracy McGrady. Hudson runs it down. Tracy is really strong. Oh, oh no! Oh. Who is that? Othello Harrington. Othello Georgetown. Why was he jumping? Patrick Ewing and Alonzo Mourning are shuddering somewhere. Othello, Othello like never blocked the shot in his life. Why is he jumping? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what they really want to do is sit around, look at some killer basketball highlights. So, hey, LeBron James very nicely has accommodated us mm -hmm. by having a birthday today. That just gives us carte blanche. We have an excuse. We're just going to show you a bunch of awesome video. You know, this conversation actually started with LeBron, who does turn 32 today. He was asked to compare himself to Michael Jordan at the same age. And, and it really is an interesting inflection point to look at the numbers because Michael had won three titles by 32. And guess what? Same for LeBron. And because LeBron didn't have to go through that, you know, whole pesky college thing first, he has already racked up more points, rebounds, and assists than MJ. Not to mention, he does have one additional one of those shiny MVP trophies. So if what LeBron told us this summer is true, and he really is chasing Michael Jordan's ghost, Michael Jordan, not dead, but, you know, that's what he said, um, to see who is the most dominant player of all time. It was news to Michael Jordan when he said that. That's all I'm what? saying. He's not dead. <laughs> um, he is at least on the way, right, to making a case for himself. Now, that being said, LeBron does feel that's where the similarities stop. He gave a quote yesterday on their actual playing styles. He was having none of the comparisons. As much, he was uh, much more of a scorer, um, you know, and at that point, did a lot of just uh, a lot of post work at that point in time. Um, but our games are just different. Um, his body is different. My body is different than his. All right, so who does LeBron compare to in the way he plays? I mean, he's obviously, right? Guy's got a lot of magic in his game. The court vision, the passes, the way he controls the floor. Who's that coming? Coming. that show? Oh, oh, look at that. Coming. <laughs> we also have, hey, producer Danny called this morning LeBron the rich man's Pippin, mm. which is maybe the first time he's been called that. Wow. Certainly defensively, you can see Scotty's influence on LeBron. We could yeah. run a half dozen of these chase down blocks, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's good. And then Cavs coach Ty Lue, his comparison mm. was he thought LeBron has the same explosiveness as Dominique Wilkins. Another compliment. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think there's any question when you you talk about one of the greatest dunkers of all time right. finishers. Neat. I mean, that's LeBron, too. Right, yeah. and of course, you got to throw in Dr. J, as far as I'm concerned. If you're going to talk about athleticism, boom, there you go. And Oscar Robertson, look, we keep talking about Oscar in reference to Russell Westbrook right now because of the triple doubles. But let's be honest, all a triple double is is a way of measuring all around influence in a basketball game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is probably the most LeBron James thing of all. The best thing you can say about LeBron is he does everything exceptionally well. He can play one through five, guard one through five, score when he has to, facilitate when he has to. And look, his leadership skills have improved every year he has been in the league. At 32, he now has better numbers than he did at this point last season. Oh, and by the way, along the way, he did happen to topple a 73-win team led by a two-time MVP thanks to the best NBA Finals comeback in history. So, you know, it's possible that he's actually comparable to no one. Of course, that's not going to stop all of us from <laughs> trying. All right, so guys, who do you think influenced LeBron the most? I mean, I, we saw a highlight there, Byron, that you may have something to say about. 
You know who I'm going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> Do you it. know I'm going to say Irvin Magic Johnson. Of course. Right. I mean, we just talked about it. He can guard one through five. Mm. Magic Johnson can guard one through five back in the day. He can play every position. Magic Johnson could play every position sure. back in the day. He can facilitate. We know Magic was the best mm -hmm. facilitator of all times. His vision. We know Magic's vision was the best. Now, you add the fact that, like LeBron said, he can score when he wanted to. Believe me, Irvin Magic Johnson back in the day could average 25 points right. a game if he wanted to. And then you look at the other thing I compare, compare him to is that these two great football players who also oh. played college basketball, yeah. Tony Gonzalez wow. and Tony Gates, box. were two of the best tight ends ever. Yes. Put LeBron, and I've always said this oh, about LeBron man, James, right? he is a tight end in a basketball uniform. Yep. He would have been untouchable in the NFL as well. And we already know he's untouchable on the basketball court. Well, remember, he had that flag football game, him right. and Kevin Durant. So he feels like he is a receiver of sorts. He, he is. So there's that. Now, I'm with you on Magic. I'm with you on Oscar Robertson. Right. I would throw in the upper body or the body frame of a Carl Malone. I would add Ooh. that into the equation. Because like LeBron is built like a truck. I don't think we've seen a guy as chiseled as LeBron since this guy right here, the mailman, Carl Malone, who was built like a brick house. So... That's the other part of the equation that I would throw in there. I would throw that LeBron's strength is only rivaled of that of a guy who's one of the greatest power forwards of all time. Yeah, well, well, I would agree with you there as well. And one thing that I left out with LeBron is we, we talk about his athleticism, but his speed and his quickness mm -hmm. is unmatched when you look at somebody his size. And Carl might be the, the, the closest guy to him when you talk about those two elements of his game as well. And he's 32. I mean, yeah. he, he pointed out yesterday to reporters, he said, I'm like a fine wine. I just keep <laughs> aging well. I don't know how many more years we have of this version of LeBron, but it's it's looking good this year. As I said, he's his numbers are better than last year. Looks real good right and, now. And let's so, keep enjoying it as long right? as we can. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I love that you brought up those flag football games yeah. because I, I did notice those flag football games stopped when Durant became more of a threat to LeBron. Yeah. It was like, yeah. oh, look, I want to help him out. <laughs> right. have some fun. Work out with him in the offseason. Off That's all done. Exactly. Yeah. See you later. That's what true competitors do, though. I can't yeah. imagine why. Nah, yeah. I don't know why I'm no, there. You're getting a little too close. Exactly. All right. All right, let's turn our attention to last night's game in Cleveland. The Cavs had an 18-point lead at the start of the fourth quarter, but they did have some trouble putting the Celtics away. Boston pulled to within one three times in the final two minutes. They did end up falling 124 to 118. So, George, you could kind of look at it either way. Did the Celtics losing that way to the Cavs tell you they're close or they're not really remotely close? Yeah, I don't believe they're remotely close. I, I look at this team and I think they're really good. I just don't think they're great. And to right. be a championship contender, which is what Danny Ainge and everybody in Boston wants, you have to be that. They're missing a couple of elements, Byron. I think that they're missing a real wing. Now, maybe Jalen mm -hmm. Brown turns into that guy. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that next pick that they have turns into that guy. They need that, but they also I also feel like they need a real post presence. Mm -hmm. They need a rim protector, a guy who can give them easy buckets. That's just not what Al Horford does. Right. So you look at a guy like DeMarcus Cousins, right? Could they trade for him using that Nets pick? Or maybe even a Hassan Whiteside, where maybe you don't have to give up the Nets pick. But someone like that and a wing, and then all of a sudden we can talk about them being a could championship the, team. Could they trade for anyone is what Celtics fans want to know. They've been well, waiting I, on this big trade date he's going to pull off for yeah, a couple seasons. Yeah, I think they could because now. they got so many draft picks that they can use in a trade mm -hmm. that are very attractive to a lot of teams. Teams. But I, I agree with you, George, is the fact that they are a very good basketball team. And I, I said this when Al signed with them uh, this offseason, that that's a great piece to the puzzle. But he's not a game changer, mm -hmm. but he's a great piece to the puzzle. So they've taken another step forward you know, in the Eastern Conference, which is very slim anyway. There's no team in the Eastern Conference that I look at right now that's going to challenge Cleveland for a championship as far as the Eastern Conference is concerned. But the Boston Celtics and Toronto, those two teams can make it interesting. But still, at the end of the day... Cleveland's still the, the, the favorite. Rachel, far. they're like a baseball team that has a bunch of two and three starters. Right. They don't have they the don't number have one. Right. Yeah. Like Isaiah yeah. Thomas yeah, and Al Warford right. are good players, right. all-star type players, but they're not a definitive number one guy. Yeah, I mean, the Celtics are now 0-6 against the top two teams in either conference. Not there. Rough night for the Raptors the past couple games, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. So the Cavs, again, distinguishing themselves <laughs> as the class of the conference. Not that we didn't know that already. Let's talk about the Lakers. L.A. outscored 31-13 to in the third quarter last night. At home to the Mavs, Dallas, not a good basketball team this year, and yet the Lakers did still manage to lose to them their 14th loss in the last 16 games. And afterward, Coach Luke Walton said, quote, as a team, you know, we're going to be fun. We're going to figure it out. But when is the question? How much does it mean to us right now to figure it out? Do we want to do it now, or do we want to wait two or three years? Take a look. The Lakers hold the worst record in the league in the month of December, 2-14. and 14. 
This is after they were 10 and 10 heading into the month. So, Byron, if you look at Luke's equation here, are we going to figure it out right now or is it mm -hmm. going to take two or three years? Where are you putting your money? Well, it's going to take two or three years. Now, when he said, do we want to wait? We all know LA fans don't want to wait. <laughs> yeah. And if they wanted to wait, I wouldn't probably be sitting here with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Hey, so listen, you're being honest. Listen, yeah. listen, they don't want to wait. Yeah. I understand what he's saying, but you're going to have to, unless they can make a trade or, or like you said, make that draft pick that can come in right away and be a game changer. They're going to have to wait for these young guys to continue to develop. And they will. They will develop. They'll get better and better. But they are still a year or two or three away from being a team that can contend in the playoffs. I'm with Byron. That first month of the season was a little fool's gold there, mm -hmm. basically. They dealt with some injuries. Then they had to play eight and nine guys for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And this team isn't built for that. There's a reason those guys weren't set out to play those type of minutes. But what what is a real progression here? Isn't 30 wins, shouldn't that be enough for this team? And I still feel like they're on you know, a path for 30 wins, potentially, that would be a really good season for them. You're talking about a 13-win improvement. Well, I mean, I think what part of what Lou's talking about is he's just looking for some fight from the individual guys. He said in his post-third quarter, in between the third and fourth quarters last right. night, he was like, I thought we would fight more than this. And right. I think that's when he's looking at the individual players, guys like D'Angelo. He wants to see some of that individual growth. What do you expect? Yeah, I think that's exactly what he wants to see. He, you know, you, you can't settle in on accepting losing. Right. You know, when, when you lose a game, and you know, we can go back to the, the, the 80s and the 90s, like when we lost two in a row, it was like the world was coming to an end. You know, really? you got to have that type of intensity every single night. When you lose a game or you lose two in a row, three in a row, whatever the case may be, you got to come in like it's game seven, the next game. You know, leave it all out there on the table. And I don't think that's what he's getting right now for the young guys. They're kind of settling in. And I, I still think they're in that figure it out stage. You know, it's still early in the marriage. They're still trying to figure it all out. But it is going to take some time, so people just have to be patient. Byron, the reality is this, and Rachel, is that they brought in some veteran guys like Lou Dang and Timothy Mozgov, but mm -hmm. they're not the best players on the team. And to change that type of culture, the guys who are the best players on that team have to change that culture. You need a leader. Yeah. And patience, apparently. And patience. And patience. Lots of it. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs>